Today we're going to talk tariffs here, another subject that I've been tagged into here on YouTube. Let's bring some intelligent conversation to this and let's really understand what's at stake and what is often viewed as a, seen as a very populist measure that initially appeals to people but may in the end bring disastrous results. Let's get into it. Let's be intelligent. Let's put our philosophical mindset on. Let's go. And a very good morning to you. If you're new to the channel, welcome to you. I invite you to subscribe and hit the bell for all notification. We do a lot of fun stuff on here. Vintage audio, metal detecting, uh, demonstration, cooking, live streaming, etc. Fundraising for charity. Things that we generally have enjoyed doing here for years. So I invite you to be a part of it. But another thing we do is here is I have a chance to talk about history and its context with economics and try to relate that to what's going on in the world today. And my biggest contention over the years, as people will tell you on the channel, is human nature never changes. And because of that, people tend to history. The same mistakes are repeated over and over again. Because each group or individual person comes along, thinks they have a better idea, and in the end, usually goes down in flames for failure to see the same problems that doomed decision-making in the past, right? It's human pride at work. I have a better idea. Let's get into... Uh, what happened in the 1920s and then at the end we're going to relate that to what could possibly be coming up in the future and the amazing parallels that are setting themselves up for an exact repeat potentially of some of the disasters of the 1930s free trade was an idea really in the 1920s shipping commerce really were, were not a huge part of economies back at that time unless you happen to be a nation such as England it was seafaring with large colonial interests that goods had to move back and forth by and large though the United States was a pretty self-contained entity and uh, what trade we had was usually with Mexico and um, particularly in Canada as a result of World War I, the demand for agricultural products in the United from the United States skyrocketed. Europe was a shambles. Russia was a shambles. There was really the, the bread baskets of the world had been pretty much waylaid during the entirety of World War I, and it really depended on the United States farmers to fill that need not only to bring relief to say Belgians as Ho Herbert Hoover arranged in, in 1915 as, po in, as in the wake of the German invasion of uh, Belgium touching off World War I, it was also charged with feeding the soldiers that went over and also supplying the allies as well as the home front. It was a very, it was a good time to be a farmer. Farm prices rose dramatically. Well, like anything else, it comes to an end, and World War I certainly came to an end on November 11th of 1918. And after that, the push was to get troops home and to just return to normal. Well, normal to farmers meant, <laughs> boy, we got a real overproduction problem here right now because other nations are turning to till the soil again that were uh, interrupted by war, i.e. France and Belgium and Netherlands and other nations, and, and their own farm industries began to rise again. This was an incredible threat to American uh, farmers and agricultural prices collapsed accordingly to the extent that really agriculture was a real lead in to what happened in the Great Depression. It was the first real sector of the economy to feel the crushing weight of uh, depression because farm prices going down meant that farm banks started to fail. Farmers started to go bankrupt and auctions became the order today in a lot of in, in a lot of places. A very sad time. It didn't get a lot of headlines because on the other hand, 
we had a broad explosion in manufacturing of automobiles and appliances and, and, and radios and all sorts of new industries and products were coming on to the market, particularly in the United States, a hotbed of innovation as these products made their way to market. But this explosion in productivity and production led to to a led to a mismatch between what can be produced in mass scale assembly lines and things like that and people's ability to purchase that right we had overproduction that was lending itself to uh, to under consumption at least according to what was produced well this was a real problem because wages did not keep up with the ability to consume what was produced. We see sort of this similar eerie parallel today where people, people's standards of living are being perceived to fall behind the ability to improve. And in fact, absent credit, they would clearly, clearly decline. There was a move on in the League of Nations after World War I in 1927, and the United States did not join the League of Nations, remember. They did not get enough votes under Woodrow Wilson's presidency to do that. But they, in 1927, in one of their economic council meetings, said we should really try to eliminate tariffs in the world and really have free trade. Well, the United States had a far different view, particularly conservatives and uh, particularly Republicans. A lot of them tended to be from agricultural states that were really disproportionately disaffected, disproportionately affected by what was happening after World War I. And well, naturally, the easy solution is, well, let's protect what we have by making sure that we're not flooded with uh, cheap foreign imports. Let's close the door to that, right? Let's put America first, our own jobs, our own industries. It's, you know, it's clearly a thought grounded in some type of initial sense of why we should have this. And it started to pick up momentum and then the crash of 1929 happened and then the pressure was really on because things started to come unraveled particularly on the world scene and in initial stages in the united states so senator smoot of utah and congressman hawley of oregon put forth legislation that would raise tariffs on imported goods 900 categories of imported goods from 20% to 60%. Well, they're, they're pretty huge numbers when you think about it. Well, here's where things get a little lost in the sauce. Had we not had a Great Depression, maybe we would have had a clear view of what effect that these tariffs had. But because the Great Depression was a worldwide phenomenon to a great extent, it's hard to separate out what effect these tariffs had on the United States economy. One thing we do know is that exports declined 71% from 1929 until 1932, resulting in who knows how many jobs being lost. In addition, the pressure on agricultural, with that loss of other markets in the world and exports, additional bankruptcies began to multiply through the system, particularly in the farm belts, because now it was a point where, well, guess what other nations started to do when the Taft-Hartley, when the uh, Smoot-Hawley uh, bill was passed in July of 1930 and signed by President Hoover, well, guess what happened? Other countries then decide, well, if you can put a tariff on us, guess what? We can put a tariff on you. Even our most dear trading partners like Canada were suffering under these, uh, these, ex these import limitations and as a result there's no denying that world trade contracted dramatically and very very clearly 
the cause of that to the great extent was the tariff barriers that were enacted in the early 1930s and each nation in its own agony as the depression deepened would itself turn to raise tariffs in an attempt to sort of protect itself from cheap goods and competition. Well, eventually those tariffs were repealed and we went through a whole era here where um, we moved more and more towards globalization and free trade. Well, that seemed to come to a dramatic end when the COVID pandemic hit because it laid bare to a lot of people that were very weak in our own domestic manufacturing. We can't even supply the stuff we need here and we had tremendous uh, shortages and things. So the call, the rise of protectionism began again. Now we're many generations removed from Senator Smoot and Congressman Hawley. Something like almost a hundred years we flash forward and we have people thinking the same ideas today about a tariff. Now what, what are the results of that? Initially when a tariff goes into place, you do have an, uh, an initial surge of consumption and purchasing. The reason being is the same thing that people are contemplating today. Should I buy a washing machine now before a tariff goes into place? Will it be passed along to me? Who's going to eat the increase? Will the manufacturer? So some measure people begin to purchase now in anticipation of that and it drives economic activity uh, upward. But there's no initial surge to do greenfield manufacturing and build up, let's say, a washing appliance industries here in America. If anything, we just have this surge of demand towards the very products that we want to try to keep out. And then in short order, that demand is, is uh, satisfied. But let's get down to some of the real theory now. In 1930, as a result of the uh, tariffs that were imposed uh, back then, Smoot Hawley, 1,000 economists signed an open letter to the United States government just begging them, or just telling them this is a terrific mistake. Now, why would that be? Well, one particular reason is you cannot hide from competitive pressures. You know, do you want to watch a football game where one team is consistently allowed to start on the 50-yard line and the other team has to start from the 20-yard line every offensive series that they run? What happens is the team that gets the advantage weakens because of that advantage over time. They win initially, but over time they become gutted of a competitive spirit and a need to be better. Let's face it, what we're trying to protect here is an American standard of living that has really been visibly slipping for decades. And only through the easy uh, availability of credit have many people been able to plug that decline with using credit and basically becoming indentured servants to, <clears throat> to credit. And that itself has a whole host of problems that we can talk about. But shielding yourself from that through tariffs also has another effect, too, that it, it punishes the people that can least economically afford to survive within an economy because it takes the lowest purchase op option out of their hands and it makes it even more difficult, at least in a short and intermediate run, to be able to afford the things that used to be less expensive before. Think about your Dollar Trees and how much they meant to the economy. The Dollar Generals, the 99 cent plus stores when they were around, there was this low level of, of uh, availability that basically keeps people going. You remove that and prices go up and there's a certain number measured in tens of millions of people whose standard of living will further decline because they cannot afford those items that are now more expensive through tariffs. The other thing too is tariffs prevent and obviate and truncate the need to be creative in an economy. 
I'm not saying it's good to be flooded with goods, but you could be flooded with goods that all of a sudden the, the, the greed builds up on the other end of that and they start to shoot themselves in the foot and, and creative people find workarounds. They develop whole new products and industries that allow them to move ahead and, uh, and, and become more competitive and create whole new industries that nobody ever dreamed of. So high tariffs blunt creativity, right? They take away, they have the disincentive to do that. Over the long run, it may be a different story, but as the great economist John Maynard King said, in the long run, we're all dead anyway. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a rather gloomy guy, okay? But what would the result be in the United States when we start to get into a competitive tariff situation? 11% of our economy is built on exports. You might think, well, so what? 90% is still going strong. It doesn't work that way in economics. It's always what happens at the margin that controls the rest of the nation. And it's usually somewhere around the 5% mark. 5% of the banks go bad. Well, you could say 95% of them are good, but they have an untoward effect on the other 95% of banking banks that causes them to have problems within their own operations. If 5% of the real estate goes, you see, you see the point I'm making. 10% is a huge number, and it probably translates to tens of millions of jobs that are directly directly tied to uh, world trade. So it's not as simple a matter as we'll all be happy because we're protecting jobs and industry here. You know, on the other side of the equation is the other side of that is we may not be able to afford what may be produced here. And some people are going to have to go with that. Well, I told you there were some eerie parallels between 1930 and today. And we've already spoken about how this populist rise of the idea of tariffs comes into place, just like it did in the 1930s in the Republican Party. Here we are again with the idea of, uh, of tariffs in this Republican Party. It's a very populist idea. It sounds very good in theory, and it's politically very attractive to uh, people. But... We know that we also eerily have another parallel. We have prices in equity markets and stock markets at all-time highs, just, they, just like they were in late 1929, with nobody knowing what would come, ahead, what would come after October of 1929, the worst depression in United States history. Did the tariffs help? Clearly, they hurt. And that's something that we have to think about because it's almost like all the stars are aligning that history repeats itself once again. And we have to be very, very careful. In physics, if you've studied it, for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And nowhere is that more true than in economics when it comes to tariffs. Well, we shall see if you've enjoyed this discussion today and if, if it's helped you understand a bit about the tariff issue, the proposed tariffs on, on say, uh, across the board would be 20% Trump and then targeted to China to 60 to 100%. Likely it would be a disaster for international relations, but again, we shall see. America first is a great idea, but we have to be America smart, too, all right? We don't want to be that uncompetitive lump that at the end just goes down the drain because, well, we didn't hold our feet to the competitive fire and get the fire in our belly to do even better. Those are my thoughts. Again, if you've enjoyed the content, please take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell for all notifications. I'm trying to do these videos here that I've been tagged into or asked to address over the last couple months, and I hope you enjoyed this one. Please hit the thumbs up, and I will see you on the next video. Thanks, everybody.